Welcome everyone to the first Carmine Street Metrics of 2021. Um, thank you for joining us during this quite turbulent and anxiety producing week, but hopefully this will be a, uh, a nice respite and definitely, I definitely look forward to hearing some great, great poetry today. Uh, our feature readers today will be Anna Evans, Uchi Obuji, and Wendy Vidalog. Um, and um, two of our features are joining us from Colorado, uh, which is one of the advantages of doing these on Zoom, really not geographically limited. So as always, we're going to um, start with an open mic and I'm going to mute everyone and you know, uh, start unmute, ask, ask people to unmute um, as I ask them to read. Uh, please note that I cannot unmute you myself, so you will always have to unmute yourself. I can only ask you to unmute. Uh, and the rules of the open mic are uh, the usual, which I think most of you know, uh, one poem only, uh, three minutes or less. So uh, we're going to start with the open mic and intersperse the open mic with the feature readers throughout the reading. And our first open mic reader will be Shane Hanlon. So Shane. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I apologize in advance because I have to jump off the call at four. I have a, uh, uh, the reading of four, I have a family obligation. All right, I'll start. Packed. This is the day. Go through the window, push through the hedge. If you look hard, you'll see two thin rusted ladders against a wall they almost blend into. You and I will stand on them. Soft blue blankets will be draped from their rungs. Passerbys will gawk and snap picks. Rip Van Winkle will officiate. Rip will talk about the reserves. Listen to the body, he will say. Rest, let your brain do its work. Don't be too Puritan or follow too much news feed. You never know, a century could pass by. When we climb down, a friend of yours I choose will be on your side and one you choose on mine, waiting to put the soft blankets around our shoulders. Then walk to an empty playground. There will be cold trees, a still merry-go-round, black rubber floor, colorful jungle gym, sporadic bulky animal sculptures, and a slight drizzle on heavy picnic benches, all set up with beef jerky for camping trips, past and future. Can we reach Alaska? with an intact wishbone for the many desires we will need to resist. Ghost pepper for the small flame we will fan and stoke. Salt water for the rain and wind that will shake our door, but it will not fall. Bagels, because we are both morning people. For flowers, a blue plastic bag snagged in gnarly branches zips in the wind but I could do this even without flowers. We take new names. That's it. Thank you, Shane. Our next reader will be John Foy. Thanks, Anton. Can you hear me or am I still on mute? I can hear you. You can hear me, okay. Um, I just want to say that it's a, it's a real honor to be reading, to be here with Anna and Uche and Wendy. And I'm glad that um, we can all come together uh, through Zoom for this. Um, I'm going to read a short poem, which is actually, it's a poem that is made up of lines um, borrowed from poems written by several friends of mine. Um, so it's kind of like a composite. Um, it's like a recycling. And... 
I've gotten permission from everybody here, so I, I don't think I'm going to get into trouble. Um, and the lines come from poets um, in order of appearance. Anton Yakovlev, Ben Downing, Jenna Lay, A.M. Juster, Dan Brown, David Katz, Nasheen Youssef, Quincy Lair, George Green, and uh, Linda Stern. Recycling, Cento number two. And um, speaking of Ringo Starr, this poem has an epigraph from the Beatles. I get by with a little help from my friends. Oh, reasonably well-known driver. I say, let us talk our little talk. The bald God is testing you. Did I mention the leg trap? On some, it will not have been lost. That life and love are fleeting, we all know. But what is it we are? I watched two 20-somethings on the train, tacky little skanks. They were not chosen to be saved. Thank you, guys. Thank you, John. That was awesome. Um, all right. Our next reader will be R. Nemo Hill. You can hear me? Yes. Where I am, in a house full of rooms filled with books, on a ridge in a grove of black locust, in a world raised by ladders and hooks from the bridge between hocus and pocus, near a field grazed by cows and wild turkeys on a porch, freshly painted deep blue. On a stage or a stair where my work is the bone I both toss and pursue. On a chair that belonged to a dead man. By a window this speckled with grind, all my gifts and the ghosts in my head and my heart, worn transparent by time. Thank you, Nemo. And uh, glad to have you with us today. Um, next open mic reader. I will have one more open mic reader before the first feature. So next open mic, mic reader will be Hillary Sedaris. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to read a poem called South Slope. That's a part of the neighborhood of Park Slope in Brooklyn, which continued to expand um, and got to be um, quite large in the real estate world a few years ago. South Slope. They got to us the tangled mass of black cords coiled under the desk, the power strip furred with dust, our lost black and white hairs, the fervid urge to sell, to clear off every surface, take wide angle photos of our square footage, looking better than it ever was. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilary. So it is now my honor to introduce our first feature reader, Anna Evans. Anna Evans gained her MFA from Bennington College and has received fellowships from the McDowell Artist Colony and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. She currently teaches at the West Windsor Art Center and Rowan College in Burlington County. Her collection on the dark waters surviving the Titanic is available from Able Muse, and her sonnet collection, Sisters and Courtesans, is available from White Violet Press and Kelsey Books. 
her website is www.annamevans.com. And really looking forward to your reading, Anna. So okay. welcome. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right, um, if you saw my Facebook post, you will see that I decided I was going to give a reading with the theme of the state of America. So that's not ambitious at all. Um, so it does mean that I'm gonna be reading a few poems that I don't usually read. So from Sisters and Courtesans, which is this book here that Anton just mentioned, I'm gonna read two poems that I often avoid because I usually read the poems that are in the voices of the white women and these ones are not. My life as an Apache scout. White men are afraid of me. Their wives simper in long skirts. I ride and fight, sworn to defend the honor and the lives of the Apache people. In the night, I sometimes fox walk through their clumsy camp and listen to their snoring. In the day, I track them clearly by the noisy tramp as they pass through our woods, their easy prey. But they have guns. We steal them where we can. I taught the chief, my brother, how to shoot and they outnumber us. We need a plan, better than raids and ambushes en route. As for this drink that makes our braves heads thick enough, we've got no chance once we get sick. I don't think I've actually ever read that one in public before. I sometimes read this one, my life in the Jim Crow South. I've always gone to church with Ma and Pa and liked it fine, but this new preacher man is different. He's against the Jim Crow law. Pa keeps saying that the Ku Klux Klan is gonna whoop his ass, but he ain't scared. He's from the North and got himself a plan. Preacher says now we all gotta be prepared. I'm so hoping things will change around here. He's been getting the old schoolhouse repaired. I'm gonna learn to read and write next year. Preacher keeps saying what white folks say is lies. He's real smart, but I still feel the fear when I got to walk by them old white guys. And Mr. Collins just looks at me with those eyes. Okay, so that's Sisters and Courtesans, and now I'm going to read a poem from Underdark Waters, which Anton also mentioned. This book, this book is about my mother's death seen through the lens of the Titanic disaster, so you would think it would be hard to find a poem on the state of America in it, but I nevertheless have one, because of course, if you know anything about the Titanic disaster, you know that a lot of it was about class, and that is a problem in America today. Underclass. This is a haiku, which is a sequence of haiku that is also a pontoon. And it has the epigraph. Mary refused to be parted from John under the women and children first edict and was lost in the sinking. Black ice in my veins. I can't see my husband John, the man I stayed with. Sleep pulls me under. I can't see John, my husband. Someone's crying out. Sleep pulls me under. Beneath the water again, someone's crying out. In the name of God, beneath the water again, my mouth full of brine. In the name of God, can anybody hear us? My mouth full of brine, freezing bitter tears. Can anybody hear us? The boats are far off. Freezing bitter tears, cannot summon them near us. The boats so far off. The man I stayed with, cannot summon them near us. Black ice in my veins. And then I will have to, of course, to, to opine on the state of America, read a couple of poems from the Unacknowledged Legislator, which is my most recent chapbook of political poems. So we we're going to start with one that is incredibly appropriate this week called The Divided State of America. I wonder how they sleep at night those folk who disagree with me. Although their views are driving current policy, the joke is on them when they watch the nightly news and see the protest rallies everywhere, each witty hat, each cutely worded sign. Aren't they ashamed? Do they not even care? The country will remember them as swine. But then I see they think the same of me, that they're the strong ones while my kind are flakes impossible for either side to see the other's merits or their own mistakes. By day, we all shake our self-righteous heads. At night, we lie uneasy in our beds. Uneasy indeed this week. And another one also from this book 
um, perhaps the most reprehensible thing that I think that the Trump regime did was the separation of families at the border. And so I wrote this Villanelle yeah, to, uh, to make account of that. It's called Not My Son, McAllen, Texas, June 2018. Last night, a woman crossed the southern border, heat haze and scrub, two armed men with blank faces and rumors of a presidential order. She had a baby with her who adored her and sang him lullabies of safer spaces last night. This woman crossed the southern border, leaving her town of ruin and disorder because she trusted others know what grace is and hadn't heard the presidential order. She didn't fear the men who came toward her, explaining she would be one of their cases last night. This woman crossed the southern border and begged asylum. First, the men ignored her, then warned the women to stay in their places while they enforced the presidential order. Nomi Iko, the refugee implored, her stricken mind confused by legal phrases. Last night, a mother crossed our southern border. We took her son by presidential order. And then I want to read at least one poem from the Quarantina Chronicles. This is the fun book I wrote in April of 2019, sorry, 2020, because we were all in lockdown. And so I decided that every day I would get an article from a newspaper and do a word cloud from it and then take three of the top words and write a tritina. And then at the end of the month, I took all of the tritinas, threw them in a word cloud, picked the top six words and wrote a sestina, which is the last poem in this book. So. I am going to read one of the tritinas, which I think also sums up a lot of what's happened in this uh, country during the virus. It's called, she'd worked for almost 30 years at the hospital and it's from the article, Detroit healthcare worker dies after being denied coronavirus test four times. She'd worked for almost 30 years at the hospital. In March, she experienced symptoms of coronavirus and drove there, but was refused a test. A week later, she was refused a second test and again sent away from that hospital. The third time, they said she most likely had the virus and to stay home as if she had coronavirus. The fourth time she went, they also didn't test. The fifth time, her family carried her to a different hospital. In this hospital, she died of the virus, proved by the test. Okay, I have just two more poems I want to read. The poem I wrote when I had the virus, right? We all know that fun fact, right? I had the virus for 16 days. I was in quarantine and then not particularly well for another two weeks. This is called Abecedarian for 2020. And I guess I should dedicate it to Kim Bridgeford, my friend. Apocalyptic years begin insidiously. Your best friend discovers she has cancer and there's news from China about a mysterious, highly contagious disease. One minute, Australia declares a state of emergency and you turn on the TV to see fires raging. The next, there's a global pandemic and everyone's locked down at home. You play cards and drink wine, it gets worse. I can't breathe, says George Floyd with that cop's knee at his jugular. Your best friend, her name was Kim, dies. You turn 52 at a Black Lives Matter protest. The internet jokes, who had murder hornets for May? Not you, you're just trying to keep track of the cancellations. Olympics, Wimbledon, Lollapalooza, Broadway, and pretending to cope. You teach classes online. Quarantine follows quarantine and it's suddenly fall. Russia is again interfering in the presidential election. Spotted lantern flies are swarming Philadelphia. Trump claims credit for defeating COVID-19. The word unprecedented is meta commentary. Finally, you get the virus. Shut yourself in your bedroom watching MSNBC. Wisconsin polls look good, but Pennsylvania not so much. Experience tells you to trust nothing. You write a poem, this poem. You hope Hurricane Zeta will be the last disaster of 2020. It isn't. And I'm gonna finish with the last poem in the political book, which is called Standing Up. And it's sort of my philosophy of what we all need to do. So, hey America, that's your state, this is us. David, in just a tunic, had a sling, whereas Goliath was equipped to fight, and yet the boy prevailed. So Saul, the king, the victor, put the Philistines to flight. This story may not literally be true, but has a human truth 
we yearn to hear, not just because the underdog came through. As David raised the giant's head, the cheer that first began among the Israelites soon echoed back from the opposing men, conscripted out of fear, sick of the fights, the blood and death, hungry, wondering when, if ever, peace might come or if they'd die. You ask me why, I don't give up. That's why. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for this really topical and amazing reading. I'm going to unmute or ask everyone to unmute. So if you would like, you can unmute yourselves and applaud or express your appreciation of, of our Anna. Thank you so much. Um. Great reading, Anna. Thank you. I love that poem about, well, I mean, it's so, so tragic, but the poem about the separation at the border, just, uh. yeah. That is a fantastic poem, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Everyone. Really a marvelous poem, Anna. Thank you, I appreciate it. What was the title of the last one, The Sling? Uh, the last poem I read was called Standing Up. It's in Standing the up. Standing up. Okay. Unacknowledged Legislator, which is my political chapel. All of these books are available on Amazon if anybody wants to buy one. Or on my website. And we do. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to mute everyone one more time. And then our next reader will be Chris O'Carroll. All right. Thank you, Anton. It is a truth universally acknowledged that I am an extreme poet. And the way I know this is that I have some poems in the new anthology, Extreme Sonnets. I know there's at least one other extremist in, in, in here today, and you know who you are, Wendy Sloan. Um, but uh, I just want to warn everybody, here comes an extreme sonnet. This is uh, a love poem titled Spouses Who Fight Live Longer. And that title was the headline on a LiveScience.com research story. Spouses who fight live longer. Shall I compare thee to a pugilist with butterflies bright float, bees brighter sting? We never vowed we never would get pissed enough for heated rounds inside this ring. To be one flesh and yet not of one mind can lead to clamming up or thrashing out. The latter, all the research seems to find, is better for longevity. No doubt we both have opened wounds we should repent, have landed verbal barbs with too sure aim, but the aerobic vim with which we vent feeds oxygen to love's enduring flame. So long as eyes can flash and breath come fast, so long may this close quarters combat last. Thank you and happy new year to everybody. Thank you, Chris. And our next, speaking of poets that some may consider extreme in different ways, we're going to continue with this trend and our next poet will be our former co-host, who is now in Los Angeles. And we are really happy to see him today, Quincy Blair. Okay, okay Anton, I'm unmuted. So um, right before the whole COVID uh, kerfuffle, uh, I featured uh, Four Carmine Street Metrics while in New York. So uh, this is a poem I wrote in a bar during happy hour in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, um, kind of in between sessions of the work thing that I was doing. And I decided not to read it at the reading last year because I didn't think it was ready, but it's been a year, so here we go. The place I used to live forever. I used to find it funny, Chelsea boots, crushed velvet leather pants, and one more payment always due the false extravagance of day job bohemia. I wore it well. I wore it with panache. I hoarded it like old LPs or a stoner's secret stash. As tactics went, it wasn't quite Sun Tzu. 
The archers faced the sun in a crazed assault on common sense. I think I nearly won, but nearly doesn't work in love or rent. The constant sacrifice of money to that walk-up flat. To hope this might suffice until the barricades went up again and Comrade Brummel rose to rid us of the landlord class and lineated crows. Art was life, and life was art and shit. I said it with a smirk. I stayed up, smoked my cigarettes, and made it into work. In memory's Indian summer, it was cool. The sun encountered poise to cold winds out of Canada. A constant human noise suffused the air from brownstones on the streets, as have heard notes of pride tickled my ears in neighborhoods still lightly gentrified. I'm never moving back, it fucking sucked, romantic as it was. The heartbreak turning into lines, each hangover a clause in the epic I was sure I had to write and did, and it was done. The words fell down the fire escape, not reaching anyone. Thanks. Thank you, Quincy. And yeah, great to great to have you back um, since uh, you were uh, the last in-person feature that uh, last in-person reading that we had so far. All right. So I am now delighted and honored to introduce our second feature reader, Uche Oboji. Uche Oboji, more properly, Uchena Oboji. He is a poet and spoken word performer. He fell in love with those crafts while studying engineering in Sukra, Nigeria. His charm book, Ndewa, Colorado, from Oldish Press, is a Colorado Book Award winning winner. His forthcoming book, Nchefu Road, is winner of the Christopher Smart Prize in the UK. Work has been published worldwide and fuses Igbo culture. European classicism, American Mount and West setting, hip hop, and Afrofuturism. Born in Calabar, Nigeria, he has settled near Boulder, Colorado after much world wandering. And we're really excited to hear Uchi today. Um, so, welcome, Uchi Obojim. Thank you. So not meaning to alarm anyone, but uh, I'm not sure I can do this sitting down either. So <laughs> uh, here we go. I'm going to start with um, a poem from um, the great mentor I never met, Christopher Okibo. Um, and he is also, his name is also, he gives his name to the section of one of my forthcoming books uh, in Chef Road, as um, Anton had mentioned. So this is from modern African poems, and this is a part from Distances, and it's kind of key to the book. So, um, from flesh into phantom, on the horizontal stone, I was the sole witness to my homecoming. In the inflorescences of the white chamber, a voice from very far away chanted, and the chamber descanted, the birthday of earth, paddling me through some dark labyrinths from laughter to the dream, minor into my solitude, incarnate, voice of the dream, you will go with me as your chief acolyte, again into the ant hole. I was a sole witness to my homecoming. So the book in Sheffer Road is, it was meant to have come out last year, but obviously with COVID, publishers, difficulties, et cetera, it's meant to come out this year. So it's got four sections and I picked one poem from each of the four sections. After each of the poems, there's a bit of a brief mu musical coda that goes with it. All the poems have musical associations with them. So um, <clears throat> with that, I'll just dive right in. So first of all, from section one, Azikawe, Mango Flesh. Ooh, I'd also forgotten what crackling recall the many shades of mango flesh, the many shapings of mango flesh, the many flavors of mango flesh, the many textures of mango flesh, the tumescences of varied fruits, sacred arrays upon seasonal trays, indiscreet colors of blush, all orange, formula told at the tongue, all sweet. Come like a mist, the recollections of fluid sipped through a knife slit hole, 
of opulent cubist self-serve bowl, of white-fibered stone with its cleave to pulp, the feed over seed of droop occult. In slurping up saffron from mangoid dawn, I resound on the chord of my birthing song. Chima kokwana, siabia. And uh, from part two of the of the book, Run It, um, uh, part two is uh, is uh, is called um, uh, Ojuku. <laughs> uh, this is Run It, Run It, Run It, Run It, Run It, Run It this way, Hammer Rabbi, it's mine. Run it this way, Leibniz, it's mine. Run it this way, Galenus, it's mine. Run it this way, Aquarismi, it's mine. Run to me, waters, to marshals of your springs. Run softly, sweet rivers. Listen to my song. Listen as they snore, as I kill them softly. Swell to my staff, to my sea where they belong. Run to me, whatever kennings I desire. Find me where potential guides your swift flow, where I beat this deep valley with my bare feet, where I've stamped out all my bases, need to know. Run with your languages this way. I want all your words with their secrets. Pick locks to your treasure chests. Indic and European are my usurper stop talk. Bastard children of theirs sing out at my behest. Run to me with your Moses in a basket. Phoenician heliotrope from your shellfish shoals. Phoenix sings the blues born again in your alphabets. Got your convert philosophers hooked by their souls. I'm going to calm down, slow down a bit. Run from this valley where my song excites you. Watch the tentative Tarrant army advance. Slow. They're too slow. I've mined the bed dry. Rush back to drown them at signal of my dance. Run your sciences this way. I want your redrum natura. All these worlds are mine, including Europa. Run these numbers I'm here to collect. Cornu in hand for swag bag of your copia. Run to me your logic of prank propositions. Nine spheres of your seven loaf and fish tails. I'll take even Rashid over your uni Parisians. Stigmata dogmata fl um, flush up your high swales. Run this way, wet dendrites of world nerve. Run Tibur, Alpheus, and Xanthos, Scamander. Even hell and heaven are mine to explore. River charm skin plays sylph and salamander. Run your schools this way. I'll take the library. I'll take the bursary too and the work without wage. Turn over your log tables, flasks, and retorts. I'll have telescope and micrometer screw gauge. Run your machines for my careful inspection. I might use some earthworks, a handful of hand tools. You can keep all that hydroengineering though. Save me great ladies from the overreach of fools. Run to a face they're shy to recognize. Do I look Italian, Semitic, or Greek? Yet I inherit pragmatic exchange. I pay up indulgence, their testament seek. Run rivers of Babylon, Tigris, Euphrates. Draw me the tears from their mountains of pride. Don't fear for your courses. I'll nurture your flocks. They'll bend our traditions and witness them wide. Run it this way, Beethoven. It's mine. Run it this way, Petrarca. It's mine. Run it this way, Schopenhauer. It's mine. Run it this way, Sapo. It's mine. Nile, Niger, Senegal, Congo, Orange, Limpopo, Zambezi, Azikiwe, Awolo, Sadawuna, Osokoto, Tafawa, Belewa, Biko, Ihedaraguno, Biso. All right. From part three, this is the part that's called Okibo, after the poet um, with whom I opened. This is prayer before writing. Oh, just two things on this, uh, language-wise. Chi, Nalusi are key spirits, the soul spirit and sort of the world spirits. And Ebiogu is porcupine uh, or hedgehog, both in Igbo. Prayer before writing. Bless me, Chi Nalusi, in one way at least. Guide the hand that gathers timbers to build for all neighbors. There's so much labor in learning the joints. Uh, sorry, for all neighbors, lovers, and comers, houses. There's so much labor in learning the joints, in learning the swings that turn shape into wood. So much watching for what form arouses the prime instincts of living for my clients. Save me from the blazes of my own causes. I speak to others of carpenter shop. Some have chopped away the shadows from trees. They've chopped a lacquer of sap onto their trousers. They've chopped through splinters, a biogu bath, chopped the tongues from bearers of news, chopped the wet fingers from lovers and spouses, chopped off the staff holding hands of old priests. Save me from the blazes of my own causes. 
Bless me, Chi Na Lucy, if in this sole way. Brace me with trusts in my fastens and joints, as there were true joints, as true joints, as the true joint douses. Don't let me chop that it's only the chopping. Don't let me put people in homes from whole legend. Spare them the breakdown to stops and clauses until I'm laying prone on my own cut lintel. Save me from the blazes of my own causes. Onyala, onyala, onyala kageso. Mone jeje monalala onyala kageso. And then uh, I'm going to end with a an excerpt part of the title poem of the of the uh, book. It's a ten part poem. Uh, and Chefu wrote, "This is part eight. Nchefu is Igbo for forgetting, and road is just the English word road. So Nchefu road. You could think of it as the road of forgetting, but of course, it's more complicated than that. So this is Nchefu road, part eight. The road is demanding. May or September." It asks you to consider your freight, the principles you must remember, the sequiturs you must forget, the palm tree, food chain, Ivory Coast, Gold Coast, Embra de Richesse. All these parallel cosmoses can only be born with a lightened purse. The future will tell what you've recalled from what you've wisely set aside. You'll know downstream what you've recalled from what you've wisely set aside. I then, what have I set aside? The fall of my friendships, the call of romances, the call over beginnings, the pall over endings, the small of offenses, the drawl of forgiveness, the gall of Aryan prejudice, the thrall of negritude, the stall of juju market, the ball shot from the gunboat, the sprawl of mosaic myth, the tall of Aji man tales, the shrawl of my spread clans, the wall of boarding school bounds, the all of my expanded world, the crawl of new city traffic, the drawl of elderly advice, the drama in stockpiled science, the drawl from the drool in a mouthful of drug is the toothless drawl of words which do not also serve as food. Spit them out. Must I? Must I spit them out? Have I let that draw like okra soup between the tines over the clammy goddams of my gums? Or have I held on to what my fists can hold, heeding wisdom that it's better to eat by hand? Left hand, God's hand, devil's hand across chaos. So much that's made me who I am has found this way's ditch. More has been scoured by dust devils, scratched off as I age and itch, but no more than I my proper self allow enough that I can sense the delta, which fertile mouth inhales, exhales grace, and mocks all desperation after grace. With this pen, I sign a mortgage against my humanity. I pray that the crop from the seed of my work can redeem it. O bounteous, the delta's hand, turn purulent by crude demand. If you see mami wata, Never, never you run away. Hey, sing a song of love, Wanta Obuji. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you so much, Ochiye. I am going to again ask everyone to unmute um, so we can applaud and um, express our admiration. That was really excellent. Great reading. Thank you. Fantastic, Uche. Thank you. Yeah, really fascinating. Yeah, great. Yeah, beautiful. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I love your singing, too. <laughs> really, well, <laughs> part, that's great. great coda, man, on every poem. I love that. <laughs> really. So, our next reader is Marion Shore. You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, Anton mentioned the, a need to have some comic relief right now. So I hope this will bring some to you. Stepping on the scale on a New Year's morning. 
What weight this is, you damn well know. It crept up on you slowly, though, between the turkey and the pies, the nog, the champagne's festive glow, and went right to your hips and thighs. The scale's red numbers tell no lies, and though the prospect's rather grim, it's time to give up Coke and fries, to stick to salads neat and trim, to meat that's light and milk that skim, to get up off your lazy seat, pull on your shoes and hit the gym. You dream of pastry, warm and sweet, but you have Nikes on your feet, and miles to go before you eat, and miles to go before you eat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you. Um, all right, our next reader will be T.C. Gornstein. Mute yourself. Okay. Okay, hello. Thanks for letting me be on standby. Um, and by the way, over 20 years ago, I, I'm an astrologer and I predicted that there was going to be a civil war in America. Everyone said I was crazy. And I'm still crazy, but I'm going to read you. Um, this is just a segue because uh, the poem is not really about astrology, but it has an astrological sounding title. Okay. This is called um, On Not Being Able to View the Jupiter-Saturn Conjunction. At least I had legs to carry me down two flights of stairs and outside most of the way to the waterfront. I walked as far as the sidewalk was shoveled to the underpass where I could see the garish mural of psychedelicized flowers and read the trite affirmations that still managed to be a comfort to this cynic. At least I could see a crescent moon on its descent wrapped in downy gathering clouds. At least I could smell winter in the last dregs of fall in fireplaces in the kitchen of the local old school Italian restaurant open for business surviving the pandemic. Tomorrow it will snow again. Monday it will be overcast. So most likely I will miss viewing this once in 800 years event, this Christmas star. But I am not downcast. I have already had my miracle. I got out of the city with my sweetie, lock, stock, barrel, the whole kitten caboodle to a smaller city with more space both inside and out. I do not pass a single soul on my walk. I feel blessed as I breathe in the cold, clean air, noting how some up, upended blocks of snow resemble tiny gravestones in the dusk and feel graced when I slip on an icy patch and recover my balance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Next reader will be Martin Rosek. All right. Thank you. Um, I guess a number of you know by now that I'm uh, kind of obsessed with translating a, a Czech singer songwriter. And um, I'm going to read a, a a poem of his, song of his, looking for someone who would be interested in singing the English text. Um, this is about being in exile, feeling isolated. I guess that's something that is not too hard to relate to, um, even if it has some specific references. It's called Letters. As years go by and graveyards keep on growing, I count the wrinkles etched into my face. Tram tracks are running, running without slowing, like distance, this bittersweet, quiet place. My mind's a graying hanger for memories, changing each new day into old tatters. In bars far from Prague, far from my reveries, I read all these letters, these letters, these letters. Rings stain the table from overfilled glasses, wine mixed with wormwood, shiny stickiness, 
and awkward books of miserable verses, mud from the Moldau, runny murkiness. The gardens have dressed up in dusky lilac against fading skies, dark shapes grow flatter. The tower and the blooming rose bush turn black, leaving just these letters, these letters, these letters. My loves are aging, grandchildren tug their hair. Each day a stone in a brooch with jaspers. And time, that one-handed piano player, is counting these letters, these letters, these letters. Laughter's a band-aid for my worn out features, a little feeling, some anger or such, and what's left, nothing but waiting for letters, if there's no way to touch, if there's no way to touch. I should say the, po the songwriter poet is uh, named Karel Grill. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Martin. Or um, okay, so it's interesting. I loved hearing all this poetry and the conversation and everything else. It's just really helpful to, to my psyche, you know. And interestingly, my uh, I'm going to read a poem called Pandemical Number 14, which is part of a series of 20 um, that I kind of did very fast over the summer and beyond in a way that I never do. So I, was, I was listening to Anna saying that, that she, they just came, you know, and some of them are funny, some of them are very serious, some of them are uh, political, some of them are wistful and personal. So this, what I thought I'd do is read this more personal one a wistful one, which is about missing England. I usually go to England in the summer and I couldn't. So pandemical number 14. The village I cannot visit now slides in glimpses through my thoughts. The cows grazing meadows by the river saw that lie across from a field where my father's aging into earth. His quiet body giving way at last to what we're all made of. I'm oddly shaken to think my body's a living piece of him. So he's still here, laid to rest, but living on in me. Cliche, you'd think, but having felt so separate for so long, my life, my life, I cannot say what all this means to me, except that more of me is there than I had thought. Mm -hmm. But oh, I want to see the village, my stepmother's garden, to hear the blackbird's song, to smell a rose, clink cheers, and talk of jaunts we might embark on. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And, and so we are now more going to move on to our third feature reader, and it is Wendy Vindelok. Wendy Vindelok lives in the small agricultural town of Palisade on the western slope of the Colorado Rockies. Her work has appeared in Best American Poetry, American Life and Poetry, Hudson Review, Rattle, Poetry Magazine, New York Times, Shed Creek Review, and other disparate venues. Her books are available from Able Muse Press and her chapbook from Exhot Books. Wendy is also a visual artist whose paintings are featured in galleries throughout Western Colorado. So really excited for your reading. And uh, please welcome Wendy Vidalock. Thank you, Anton. Um, I think I've got some cat hair in my microphone. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Can hear you okay. Okay. Um, gosh, this has been wonderful. Um, I want to start by um, just honoring um, all of you who have read before me uh, with a little compilation, kind of like John did earlier. Uh, and I'm calling it Words Spoken on a Sunday Afternoon. A slight drizzle on heavy park benches between hocus and pocus, and one more payment always due. We all shake our self-righteous heads. But what is it we are? The scales red numbers tell no lies. To be one flesh and not yet one mind. 
a slight drizzle on heavy park benches. Save me from the blazes of my own causes. I was the sole witness to my homecoming, looking better than it ever was, a slight drizzle on heavy park benches. I walked as far as the sidewalk was shoveled, this bittersweet, quiet place. I was the sole witness to my homecoming. <clears throat> So this is a really fun thing to do when you're sitting in a reading. And um, an old friend actually taught me this. Is he's, I'm always doodling when I'm at a, a poetry readings. Um, and my old friend Jack said, you know, write down one line from everybody. And when you get up there to read or teach, you know, honor those words. And it, it was really kind of changed my understanding of attending readings because I can tend to be really fidgety. <laughs> And it helps me to really listen. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation. This has been a wonderful afternoon. I'm honored to be with you all during these difficult and I'm calling evolutionary times, whatever that means. It is not easy to tell a story when one hasn't got a tongue. I didn't know this when I was young. The tongue and all it implies, thirst, taste, tone, nurture, nature, language, and the search for the mother tongue has been my lifelong passion and my area of study, though I didn't know that either when I was young. If in the beginning was the word, the word was one nobody heard the first language I can remember sort of half acquiring was the language of silence. In silence, the realms of dream and imagination are nourished, but so too is the realm of fear and the language of isolation. But so too is nurtured the language of listening. The art of listening isn't hard to master. Listening to the other is altogether another matter. <laughs> Out here in the West, we're well acquainted with the phrase fire danger. It simply means that weather conditions are such that any infinitesimal ember on any breeze can catch igniting a horrendous wildfire in a matter of moments. If we think of language as landscape and who among us doesn't, then it seems obvious we currently inhabit a landscape in a severe state of fire danger, which puts the poet in an interesting predicament. Here in the West, whatever one's pain, one never complains about the rain. What's good for the plains is bad for harvest. What freezes in spring is sugar beet borrowed. The river depletes, the groves expire. What blooms in summer is wildfire. For a lark, each time you speak, ask yourself if you seek not to peak or achieve inflation, but to improve the conversation. It's kind of a found poem, that one. The ax. The long standing juniper bush got the ax from us this year. We left the stump and made of it a lantern and a cairn. The neighbors stop and stare, though not in horror, or despair. May all my murders be handled with such care. Hey dad, remember the time you caught me writing? You asked what I was doing. I said I was writing a letter to granddad Joe. I was really writing a poem. So 25 years ago, my husband and I 
moved to Western Colorado from Las Vegas. We had two infants at the time. We had adopted our daughter and then I became pregnant with my son. So we had basically what we call Irish twins. So two infants at the time. We had a beat up car, about a thousand dollars. And we didn't know anybody in Colorado, but we were determined to raise our kids where the natural world would be a part of their lives. Their playground, their, their sacred ground. We had fears that they would be so isolated from the world at large in a small town that they would be raised like little rednecks, um, that they would have closed minds, that they wouldn't experience life the way we had growing up. But that didn't happen. Um, they're actually much more progressive in their politics than we are. Um, and they, um, they give us hope about the future. Um, when we moved here, we live in a red county in a blue state. Colorado's a blue state. Where we live on the Western Slope is small town agricultural country. And we always knew that it was mostly um, conservative minded people. Um, but we never saw ugliness like this until Trump. Um, and before what happened this week, my husband and I witnessed a similar thing happen right here in our little town it was before the elections, uh, before the election. And um, we happened to be downtown um, and uh, large gatherings of people were making large shows of force all over the valley. Um, and what we saw on TV this week were those same kinds of sort of aggressive behaviors. And it's really scary. Um, but my point is that I think that when we say that these people aren't human or that Hitler wasn't human, I think it's important to remember that that is human. This is human. This is what we have to deal with. Um, and it's horrible and it, it could bring me to tears at any minute. Um, but I think it's easier for us to process if we keep in mind that, that every act that we do has an effect in this world. That's the only thing that we can do. So as writers, we're always asking ourselves, you know, what good is this? Um, shed light, sing your songs, it really does matter. Um, and so, I, um, it's been like a really difficult week for everybody. And I really wanted to hear what everybody had to say about this week um, before I spoke on it. And um, that little cento, that little compilation that I did at the beginning of my reading um, was beautiful. I mean, it really sort of captured the collective, you know, a little bit of it all. Um, so let's try to hold on to all of the, all of the energy out there, hold it and um, allow ourselves to process it and not to become part of it because it's so difficult not to gloat when something, you know, like when, you know, when Trump got, you know, COVID, you know, we were all gloating, you know, it's like gloating is not a thing that we should be encouraging among ourselves. You know what I mean? So it's like the guilty pleasure of gloating, allow it in and then sort of like, allow ourselves to get there through our writing to sort of enlighten ourselves because it's a challenge for every single individual. Um, and I also wanted to say that living in such red country that we didn't realize it was such red country until Trump. But I also wanted to say on a serious note, um, there is a tragic lack of education in a lot of um, conspiracy theorist thinking um, and that, that too kind of helps us to sort of process and, and embrace this part of ourselves, this part of humanity. So thank you for letting me get on my soapbox. I don't usually do that, but you all sp spoke so beautifully to so many things happening. I wanted to honor that. And I'm gonna close with a little poem that sort of um, looks back on that decision that my husband and I made, which at the time was crazy. We had no money, we knew nobody, we had no jobs here. We just did it. Um, 
And now we look back and we think we would never do anything that crazy now. Um, and since our, our kids are now grown and, you know, my son is in DC with his partner, my daughter is here in the Valley. Um, and um, the future is, the future I feel good about um, because I have a lot of contact with the youth and I feel really good about that. So let's try to hold on to that as we get through the next couple of weeks, which are gonna be difficult. So this is um, called El Alma del Oeste. It means uh, the soul of the West. And I, I wrote this around the time that both of our kids were leaving home. So we were empty nesters and trying to figure out, well, wow, what happens next? Do we just get a divorce like most people do? <laughs> you know, like this is the time you can do it. They're gone now. <laughs> so we really had to make the decision that, okay, let's really figure this out. Um, so this was sort of an opening. It was called, it's called El Alma del Oeste, the soul of the West. In recent weeks on shifting cliffs at Canyonlands or Rabbit Hill, at Window Rock or Wrinkled Sands or mesas where this time of year slowly spill the waters, we have sighted the claw of the infant spring. We've heard the bighorn's hoof ring like children, we have peered into the bed of the West, the canyon's rib and the empty nest. Like children, we have wondered who induced all this and what comes next. And here we are, the two of us. The lynx's prints at Coral Fork have brought us to a cloud of quail. We build a cairn and turn back to the trail. A breeze can trade a mother's fear of letting go. So shall ye so. We speak in English, wind, and Espanol. Thank you all so much for the invitation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you. Wonderful. That was excellent, Wendy. Thank you.